Hey everybody, welcome back to HeartSmart. This is our final class in the HeartSmart program. Today, we're going to be talking about physical activity, which I know is kind of ironic since most of us are probably sitting at our desk right now, myself included. But we're going to talk about physical activity with a different mindset, uh, talk about the types of activity that are beneficial for heart health, but also allow you to establish a new perspective about physical activity and what you can try to focus your energy on when we look at trying to incorporate it into your lifestyle. And then we're going to tie this in to the end of our program where we're going to talk a little bit more detail about goal setting. So, you know, when we went into this program, the idea here was to help you establish healthy habits to uh, prevent heart disease. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail about developing some goals, some questions you can ask yourself to decide for yourself whether or not a goal that you want to achieve is actually the right one for you. So, and as before, anytime you have questions, if you want to type them in the chat box, we'll get to them at the end. Um, and as before, we'll also be sure to share details about the recording of this webinar, as well as the slides. And there's some other very important uh, post-program materials that I'll cover at the very end. But, you know, without getting too uh, ahead of ourselves, basically today we're going to spend time discovering the health benefits of being physically active. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this. I think it's it's been uh, well covered in previous classes and previous readings, but we're going to look also at the guidelines for physical activity. So it's not as much as getting active, but if we want to really achieve optimum heart health, there is a minimum threshold that's recommended. Doesn't mean you have to get there overnight, but when we look at long-term goals, that's going to be a threshold that I would try to encourage each of you to attain. We'll also take a look at trying to navigate through some of those obstacles that get in our way when we talk about becoming physically active. So it could be a lack of time or lack of equipment or weather. So there's lots of reasons that we might come across where it just kind of slows us down. So we'll discuss how to work through those barriers because they do happen. You know, life, you know, life is unpredictable and we can go through and have a specific plan in place, but sometimes life throws a a curveball. So we'll give you some ideas on how to work through some of those potential barriers along the way, and then finish up by having you develop your own personal prevention plan. You know, when we look at all the different concepts that we've covered in this program, from stress management, to nutrition, to weight management, and today with physical activity, I'm going to encourage you to try to focus on one key area moving forward. You know, when we look at trying to set goals, I want you to try to look at just one key area, and I'm going to share with you a doc, uh, a document that will help you tailor that uh, action plan to that one key area. But if we go back to the very first class, when we looked at what we're trying to do here, I want you to go ahead and ask these questions back to yourself. You know, when we asked about goal setting initially, I want you to ask yourself, you know, what's most important to you? What do you want most in life? A lot of times when we look at health behavior, you know, we want to we want to live a long, healthy life. We want to spend more time with families. We want to minimize some of our stress. Maybe we want to change some of our weight patterns. So what we're going to say here is at the end, I'm just going to ask you, how does your current behavior fit with those goals and values if you want to have a long healthy life where you're very active, you can enjoy the company of friends and family, and you don't have any obstacles to achieve that. How is your current behavior fit within those goals and values? So that's something that you're gonna have to ask yourself as you develop your action plan and set up tangible, relevant goals. If we look at all of the components of heart disease prevention, probably the most impactful when we look at research data about longitudinal studies that have looked at nutrition, looked at stress, looked at weight, physical activity is the common denominator. That seems to be the ultimate, um, I want to say cure, but the ultimate tool that can help 
prevent heart disease. And again, it's not about trying to go from a couch potato to a triathlete, but those individuals that are consistently getting those 150 minutes of activity each week, we are seeing significant difference in terms of health outcomes. You can see them summarized on the screen. Many of these probably won't be a shock to you because we've seen the data before in terms of diabetes prevention, hip fractures, depression, dementia, breast cancer, colon cancer, all cause mortality. All of these are the result of attaining regular routine physical activity. Now, a lot of times when we look at activity, and if you're somebody that's been using a lot of those fitness trackers like Fitbit and the Apple Watch, you'll see different exercises, different types of physical activities broken down in terms of calories, you know, jumping rope, jogging, soccer. These are just some real broad estimates for calories burned for 30 minutes of activity. Now, metabolism rates vary from person to person based on your, based on your, primarily on your weight. So this is, I think, based on uh, somebody who's 150 pounds. But although exercise does burn calories, I want you to think beyond the calorie burn because we have far greater benefits besides just burning calories. I want to go ahead and apologize. We are uh, getting pretty high call volume in our office right now around the wellness credit. So hopefully this will get picked up pretty quickly. But if you do hear the phone ringing, uh, I do apologize for that in advance. So if we look at overall exercise benefits, so yeah, if you eat uh, French fries, it's 400 calories, all right. But the benefits of that exercise far exceeds the calorie burn. If we look at it from a psychosocial standpoint, we see improved mental health, we see improved levels of stress management. And then of course that translates into a longer lifespan, but it's not so much about a longer lifespan. It's also about a higher quality of life. And what I mean by quality of life is a very important concept called functional fitness. If you are having difficulty doing your activities of daily living, whether it's getting back and forth to your car or up and down the stairways, you need to ask yourself, is this a function of my cardiorespiratory status or is this something else altogether? So a lot of times getting that first step, making activity more of your daily routine is going to make achieving functional fitness a lot easier. Now, again, much easier said than done. I mean, we're all, no one is sitting here saying, gosh, I didn't know physical activity was so beneficial, but it's important to understand where to focus that energy on physical activity. And before you get too far ahead of yourself in terms of figuring out what plan is going to work for you, if you have to join a gym or you got to join a fitness club or you have to buy a jump rope, the best type of physical activity is one that you will do. It's the one that you're going to enjoy. It's the one that you find fun. And it's the one that you can typically do with little encouragement. And since there are so many different ways to just not be sitting, you have lots of opportunities to explore what's going to work best for you. And it doesn't have to be a structured exercise plan. You don't have to join a gym. It could be as simple as going for a walk every day after breakfast and dinner or doing more yard work or working in the garden when the weather cooperates. Those are all the different things that still count towards that physical activity platform. And it's important to try to differentiate the two without going into too many boring details. But for the sake of this particular class, let's call physical activities anything that doesn't involve sitting, all right? By definition, it's just movement carried out by our muscles. It's carried out by our muscles and when that muscle moves that requires energy energy another word for calories so any movement we can call physical activity and any movement is going to be beneficial for the heart as we get that heart and uh, heart rate up and as that intensity increases that's where we seem to see the greatest benefits for overall heart health but intensity is a relative term so what is high intensity for one person might be low intensity for another. It's all about taking that first step. Exercise by definition, that's the planned, structured, repetitive movement that we use to improve our physical fitness. But again, when I say rethinking physical activity, 
for the sake of heart health and heart disease prevention, we're going to say, all right, anything that doesn't involve sitting or sleeping is going to help us move the needle towards heart disease prevention. You could further divide physical activity into more narrow components. We look at aerobic exercise. We've heard that term before, brisk walking, running, swimming. These are things that are getting that heart rate up. And when you do it for a while, like, whew, I gotta catch my breath. I'm tired. That's aerobic exercise. Anaerobic, that's more the stop and go action. Anaerobic means without oxygen. So these are those high intensity training workouts. That what that, that's what that HIT stands for. That could be sprinting. That could be weightlifting. These activities are also great for our heart. So a combination of the two, brisk walking, HIT workouts, really doesn't matter. Whichever is going to work best for you, whichever you derive the most enjoyment from while first also checking with your physician, because obviously you will go from a period of lots of inactivity. We're not trying to jump out and, and get qualified for the Olympics overnight. Want to take it slow, want to take it steady, but we definitely want to get started. In addition to those types of exercises, you also hear a lot of attention given to flexibility. So when we look at functional fitness, being able to bend over and put our shoes on and tie our shoes and get up and down out of our chair. A lot of this is greatly aided by flexibility, which is just basically moving our joints throughout their full range of motion. And again, there's no hard, fast rule as when and how often we need to do flexibility training, but I would typically try to encourage it after some of your aerobic activities. It's a little bit easier to do some gentle stretching of those joints uh, of those muscles after they're warmed up. Now, in the pandemic, unfortunately, a lot of us might have uh, evolved into a different form of activity, which I call the unaerobic. Hopefully, you're not guilty of too many of these episodes where we're binge watching TV, power napping online shopping. Obviously, this is the exact opposite of what we do for heart health. So the question often comes up when we look at heart disease prevention. As I said before, the best exercise is really one that you're going to enjoy. But there are some other variables to consider when we look at trying to get the most miles per gallon from our physical activity timetable. Now we all have limited time. So if we have limited time, what's the best way to spend it for heart health? I'm going to share with you a three minute video from Dr. Mike Evans that talks about what is the best exercise for heart disease prevention. So I'm gonna go ahead and do another share here. So hopefully this will uh, unfold without too many issues. All right. Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Evans, and today we're talking about the importance of intensity in physical activity, the stuff that gets your heart pumping. To meet Canada's physical activity guidelines, you need to do at least 150 minutes weekly of something called MVPA. So MVPA stands for Moderate to Vigorous Physical Activity. So why is this important? Well, I guess in our lives we want to invest in simple actions that improve many things. Exercise does this, from reducing heart disease or cancer to improving mental health, to simply improving the quality of our lives. Now, I often get asked, what is the best exercise? And my number one answer is definitely the one you'll do. But my second answer is, when possible, do an exercise that requires more effort or that is higher intensity. The higher the intensity, the healthier the results. Why? Well, research has shown that higher intensity activities are more effective than lower intensity activities at improving our health especially when it comes to the important stuff like reducing your risk for heart disease. But what is intensity? Well, I think intensity can be thought of as how hard a person works to do a specific activity. It's important to remember that no two people are the same. So the intensity of different forms of physical activity varies between people and depends on someone's previous exercise experience and their level of fitness. If you're inactive, any amount of physical activity can provide some health benefits. So it's best to start with smaller amounts of activity and gradually increase duration, frequency, and intensity. So how do we measure intensity? Well, we use something called a MET. So that's a metabolic equivalent. So at the high end, running might be an eight, jogging a five, and at the bottom would be resting or, or watching TV, which would be anything less than 1.5. 
Modern intensity physical activity, which measures three to six minutes, requires effort and noticeably accelerates your heart rate. So for example, walking. Depending on your speed, the Met could range from 2.3 to 3.6. Yard work could be a six. Housework could be three to 3.5 and so on. Vigorous intensity physical activity, which measures more than six minutes, requires a large amount of effort and causes rapid breathing and a substantial increase in your heart rate. Think of sports or, or shoveling heavy snow. It's difficult to sustain vigorous activity for a long time. One way to think about this is to reflect on the research on athletes. So for example, cycling really, really hard for 30 to 60 seconds and then relaxing for the same amount of time and then repeating what we call interval training has been shown to improve performance in a shorter amount of time. The same can be true for the average person. Incorporating short periods of increased intensity into your routine can improve your fitness and decrease your risk of a long list of health complications. Still a little unclear? Let's make it even simpler. If an activity doesn't cause changes in your breathing patterns or make you sweat, then you're probably getting a low intensity workout. If you can hold a conversation but still feel out of breath, you're probably in the moderate range. If you can't talk to your neighbor or, or sing out loud, you're probably in the vigorous range. If you can do moderate to vigorous activity at least 150 minutes per week, you're meeting the target. So go for a brisk walk, grab a dance partner, a garden hoe, or even a vacuum cleaner and get ready. Get set and up and go. That's all for now. Thanks for listening. Would you believe a few simple changes in your diet? Bear with me here. Let me get this off. Sorry about that. Go back here. A little technical issue here. So, as I said, the intensity is the secret weapon here. Now, a couple of notes. This is a video out of Canada, but the guidelines for our physical activity are actually the same for Canada minus the relevance of shoveling snow. Hopefully none of you have to really experience that, but you get the idea in terms of miles per gallon, if you will, if we get the most benefit for limited amounts of times, that's where the intensity can really help. So using that talk test is a good way to ask yourself, hey, is this a higher intensity activity or a lower intensity activity? But Anytime we get that heart rate up, that is what's going to help make it stronger moving forward. And the best thing that we want to try to do here is, again, choose activities that are appropriate for you and that you enjoy doing. And that's the most important thing, because if you're embarking upon something that you don't enjoy, there's a good chance a great chance you're not going to continue it. The other thing that I would suggest is always start slowly, but definitely start. A lot of times we might set physical activities, goal, physical activity goals in the, in the distant future. Well, starting in January, I'm going to start working out or when it's time for this next party or this next reunion, or when we start having our next, you know, socially distant social gathering, that's when I'm going to begin, but don't do that. There's no time like the present. When we look at goals, remember that 150 minutes a week, we can break it down into 30 minutes over five days. It can even be 10 minutes several times throughout the week. And then also try to make sure that you're doing muscle strengthening activity about two days each week. That is where we're lifting the weights, trying to do activities that make our muscles work a little bit harder than usual. And again, you don't have to invest in weights. You don't have to invest in dumbbells, but simply using soup cans or things around the house that you can use as some resistance or body weight activities, such as push-ups and squats that can also count as those muscle strengthening activities. And again, about two episodes a week is what we would suggest there. So if we look at other opportunities to get moving that are still beneficial, not so much you know, for our heart health, but also just mental health, this is where I would encourage you to tap into potentially yoga or Tai Chi. So these are activities that actually look a lot towards helping improve flexibility, but also have some mindfulness benefits too. These are both activities that we offer here through Employee Wellness. 
We have each of these at least once a month via Zoom, but there's also other opportunities online where you can engage in more Tai Chi and more yoga. So these are beneficial, but not exhaustive, but they still count as some type of physical activity. And again, I think these are some good uh, types of activity when we look at helping with overall mindfulness, meditation, and that has longstanding uh, stress management benefits. This is, a, this is a lot in terms of this particular slide. So this is something that I've identified as a potential handout for overcoming barriers. I'm not gonna spend too much detail about this, but in addition to some of your uh, other resources that I'm going to send to you afterwards, you're going to get a, a test. And the test isn't meant to test knowledge, but it's meant to test where your potential barriers are. Is your barrier mostly a lack of time? Is it social influence? Is it lack of resources? So based on that score, that'll direct you to areas where you could look for potential solutions. Otherwise, it might be a lot to take in. So what about preventing injuries? So first things first, always check with your doctor before changing your activity regimen. Try to make sure you're choosing appropriate footwear. So when we look at appropriate footwear, especially if we're doing a lot of brisk walking, non-skid supportive room for the toes, all right? If you're going shoe shopping, they say it's always good to do that towards the end of the day. Our feet tend to swell, so we wanna make sure they're getting plenty Plenty of room for breathing. And again, they're giving us support and, and making sure they're non-skid so we don't slip and fall. Uh, appropriate protective equipment. So this is common sense in terms of wearing a bike helmet if you're going bike uh, biking, uh, having li um, light cl um, colored clothing if you're jogging in, in the later at night and a, and a small light. The other thing that's very important, anytime we're more active and our, our muscles are, are burning more energy, we also want to make sure we're keeping them hydrated too. Your muscles are 70% water. So if we're being diligent with our hydration, it's very important. I would encourage you to drink before, during, and after activity. And you'll see the guideline there to use urine color and frequency as a guide. What that means is if it's a lighter color urine, that's a good thing in terms of being adequately hydrated. And if you're using the restroom about every two or three hours throughout the course of your day, that's also a fairly good indicator that you're getting plenty of hydration. Now, again, drinking more than that, is that going to have any other health benefits? No, it's not going to be harmful, but there's no need to over drink. But again, just be sensible and diligent with your hydration. So, we look at reviewing before we look at potential goal setting when we look at behavior change going back to the basics is changing the behavior important to you is changing the behavior going to stretch you beyond your present level yet is within your reach is the goal consistent with what you believe in and is it consistent with your own behavior change for your own personal desire or is this not something that somebody else wants for you and is your goal clear and specific? If you can answer yes to each of these questions, then it is time for a change. If at any time you're answering no, then it's not time for a change. You have to be ready. If we look at going back to that, that the science of habit formation, if you are not quite ready to make that change, do not push yourself in that direction until you are ready. And a lot of that readiness comes for making sure we have clear goals to begin with. So if we are looking at goals, the goal should be smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. All right. So when we say goals, we want to make sure that we know exactly what we're going after. Many of you may have a goal that looks something like this. I want to be more active. That's a great goal and it's definitely an admirable goal, but it doesn't really tell me anything and I have no way to know if I actually achieved it. To make it smart, again, we need to make it specific, measurable and attainable, all right? So to take that vague goal of being more active, make it a smart goal. I will take a 10 minute walk after lunch and dinner five days a week 
I will go for a 30 minute bike ride every Saturday and Sunday morning. I will walk to my office instead of using the shuttle during the uh, work week. You can see how each of those goals promote more activity, but they're also specific and measurable. You will know at the end of the week or at the end of a period of time, whether or not you achieved it. Here's another one. I want to eat healthier. It says, I want to be eat healthier. That's uh, my goal should be learn how to uh, type English, but I want to eat healthier. Great goal, admirable, but again, not specific. So in order to have actionable steps here, I have to put some specific variables in there over a period of time. I will pack my lunch two days a week or one day a week. I will drink water instead of soda. I will try a new whole grain food once a week. Remember, one of the important variables when we look at uh, heart disease prevention is really removing a lot of those refined grains from our diet and making way for whole grains if we choose those types of foods. Limit fried food consumption. Eat a salad with each dinner meal. So again, I'm not saying that these are the goals you have to try to make for healthy eating, but you can see how they're specific and measurable and tell you after evaluation, gosh, yes, I got to that goal. So again, just some examples of setting goals. You know, what we're doing in this plan is just trying to ensure that you're just focusing on one key area at a, at a time, whether it's healthy eating, physical activity, stress management, putting all your attention to that one key area before moving on to something else. Writing down your goals, Sharing those goals is very helpful. So this is where a lot of the fitness apps and the meal tracking apps can actually go a long way at helping shape behavior. Even if you're just sharing it with yourself, that self-reporting, that self-monitoring of that activity goes a long way to help us stay on track. As I said before, don't wait to get started. Some additional tips, find out what your motivation is. Are you doing this to please somebody else? Are you doing it just because your doctor says you have to? Well, they may be onto something, but unless you're ready to do it for yourself, we're not gonna get far. And remember, when we look at the quest for heart health, don't beat yourself up if you don't get it right the first time. We stay on track, have a plan in place, take a look at your environment. Is your environment conducive to change? Have you, have you removed some of those unhealthier food choices from the kitchen? Are you positioned to have more time in your schedule to get another 10 minutes of activity once or twice a day? And are you surrounding yourself with people that support you and your goals? These are some things that really can go a long way at keeping you on track for heart health. Now, at the end, of this program, which is where we are right now, we're going to be sending out this heart disease prevention plan. This is what you see on your screen right here. It's going to have several key areas like I, talk, uh, like I talked about, and then what specific strategies you're going to use to achieve that goal or to achieve focus in that area. So again, keep in mind our SMART goals. I'm going to ask that each of you fill this out and send it back to me. All right, send it back to our department so I can review it with you one-on-one. -on -one. So in addition to this action plan, you're going to get a link that's going to allow you to set up an appointment time where we can meet over Zoom to discuss this action plan. It might take 10 minutes, might take 30 minutes. It's really up to you. You're also welcome to come to our office and discuss it in person. Again, uh, you know, we, we encourage social distancing and masking here in our office. But, you know, if you're somebody who's like, you know what, I'm tired of Zoom. I don't mind just coming down to the office if it's nearby to you. That's fine too. You have that option. So again, we want to make sure that everyone that completes this program submits this prevention plan to us in addition to doing a very, very brief post-program survey. So unlike the other classes where we had a little test that would kind of look at your knowledge regarding the topic cover, there's no test today. It's just a post-program survey, set up a one-on-one -on -one appointment, develop your heart disease prevention plan, and that's it, okay? The points for this program actually are already uploaded to your profile, so hopefully you'll see it by next week for those of you that need the points towards your wellness credit. So that's already been taken care of uh, based on your completion of those other um, post-class tests that we had. 
If you're looking for opportunities for more physical activity, I want to just take a moment and advertise that we do have a beginner's 5K training program that's on our website. Uh, nothing magical about this training program, but we're also uh, giving out, while supplies last, free registration for the Festival of Lights 5K that will be held in Jacksonville on December 5th. I believe that's it. Yeah, December 5th. So the participation in this race is limited uh, you know, because of the pandemic um, uh, precautions there, but this is just something that was made available to us. Uh, UF Health is one of the sponsors of this particular 5K. So if you're interested in that, go to our web, uh, website on the bridge, click on that banner for beginners 5K training, have all the details there and how to submit it for uh, not just 50 points towards your wellness credit, but also uh, a free registration code for that 5K, which also has a virtual option too. So again, sometimes having a tangible goal like achieving a 5K is something that can help keep us on track in terms of our overall physical activity. So we've come to the end. So if there are any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. If not, just want to make sure that everyone is watching their email very closely this afternoon because you're going to get a lot of stuff. You know, in addition to the post-program survey and the action plan, they're going to send to you those handouts that I discussed about trying to identify barriers and how to overcome them. So it'll be a lot of content to sift through. So if you don't have any questions right now, you can send them to me later. As before, if you're just joining us late, a recording of this program will also be placed on our HeartSmart website. So there's no other questions coming in right now. I'm 